it's a real privilege uh, today uh, to have uh, Professor Garth Wells from the University of Cambridge come and speak at the seminar. Um, Garth um, leading a lot of efforts uh, in Cambridge, including a project in the Excalibur program, which is the UK's uh, Exascale program. He's one of the leaders of Phoenix, and he's going to talk about um, the future of Phoenix here. He got his PhD and uh, was at Delft before that, and I didn't know that, but he got his undergraduate from the University of Western Australia. Uh, we recently got a really good uh, submission in the FM community workshop from that university and we actually got a talk from there. So that was that's an interesting connection. Um, uh, so um, really appreciate you coming here, Garth, and uh, we'd be we'd be interested to hear. Um, what the future of Phoenix is. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Sanyo. And it's kind of the least I can do is to give a presentation because uh, quite a few times as part of the Excalibur program, I know you've presented a number of times in our workshops and also other colleagues of yours in, in the lab. So, yeah, I, I am pleased to be able to, to return that favor in some way. So, I'm actually going to be a little bit cheeky today. I'm, I'm going to talk about two topics. So. One was the advertised topics, and that's around uh, the Phoenix libraries and in particular Phoenix X libraries, but also going to slip in a, a topic at the end, which was motivated very much by some of the work that was happening in seed and in particular, the bake off problems uh, that, that led us to look quite closely at the performance of, of some of particular finite element kernels. So that works very much ongoing, but we'll try and give you a flavor of where we're at with it. So to start with just looking at. Uh, the Phoenix Library. So this work, as with many open source projects, is of course highly collaborative, and it really is the team that uh, that, that makes it all happen. So I've listed there a number of contributors, but but there are many more who have who have done you know a lot of important work in support of the, the Phoenix project and Phoenix Libraries. So I'm just going to start with a quiz. I normally do this in person. Some people may have seen this already, uh, but we'll try it online. So if I just show this bit of code, if there's chat or someone can turn their camera on and tell me what it is, I will be very impressed. Anyone just pass that and figure out exactly what it's doing? Thermal diffusion, no, it's not easy. So this snippet of code, which to me, ah, someone's got it, rotation matrix. So this is basically plane rotation from the reference BLAS implementation. So if you look carefully, it's, it's really one of the simpler BLAS functions, but it's not immediately obvious what it does. Whereas if I put this up to an audience, often everyone in the room will know exactly what it is, what it means, uh, and there'll be people who can write books on it uh, because it's very expressive. It's, it's really the, the language that we use to describe our problems. So I just want to bring, use that as a, as a slight introduction to some of the work that we've done over many years now around the Phoenix project for solving differential equations of the finite element method. And we're going to start by talking a little bit about a domain specific language that we developed and we continue to develop to hopefully allow problems of interest to be expressed very compactly and very mathematically. I'm then going to just have a bit of a tour through what I call legacy Phoenix. So this was sort of the original Phoenix vision and the libraries. And I'll talk about how they work and, and particularly at the end, focus on what didn't work and, and what were some of the shortcomings, what some of the weaknesses, because that's really motivated us in terms of a, a next generation uh, Phoenix libraries. So um, here, back to the Poisson equation. So here is, is nothing particularly taxing. So we have it here. The weak form of the Poisson equation. Uh, so we've got the bilinear form A, linear form L. And, and if you could maybe just focus a minute on the bilinear form, which of course is just grad U, grad V dot product, and we integrate that. So in UFL, if you look at the second bottom line, we've got there an expression, we've got uh, grad U, grad V, inner product integrated over dx. So that's very that, that's very, very, that expression is very closely related to what I showed on the previous slide. And most people could infer that without knowing anything about UFL. Uh, then up the top, to begin with, you know, we defined some geometry and a mesh on some geometry. So that defines uh, sort of abstractly an isoparametric mesh. Then we can define a finite element. We can define a function space on the mesh for that particular element. 
test and trial functions and, and away we go. So again, for people who you have never you know, picked up, for example, the UFL manual, they don't need to because this is often self, typically self-explanatory. So here is just some snippets from a, a more complex uh, problem. So looking at hyperelasticity, and this will show off uh, some of the features when it comes to differentiation. So this will be a nonlinear problem. So the trial function thing we're solving for would typically be an increment in a Newton solver. Uh, we'll have some kinematics there. So for those of you who are familiar with elasticity, hyperelasticity, you you recognize there immediately deformation gradient, right Cauchy green tensor. Uh, you, there are some invariants of the deformation gradient and the right Cauchy green tensor that will feed into a solver. Uh, and then we've got some material parameters. So this is, this is a really neat way then to express a particular hyperelastic model. So we've got this stored strain energy density that, of course, defines the particular model. Uh, now it's sort of textbook, total potential energy, take a first variation, we want to drive that to zero. And so that's what we'll ask our Newton solver to drive to zero for us. And to apply the Newton method, we're going to need a matrix operator. So we can then just take another directional derivative, this time of, of F. Uh, and so behind the scenes there, there's a lot of work that can go on, but we can express our hyperelastic problem very, very compactly there. So here is, is a, a snippet of a full finite element solver in what I'll call Phoenix 1.0. So this is sort of legacy Phoenix. So there's a little bit to begin with reading in the domain, creating a mesh, but then fundamentally we, we've got some function spaces. On those we can define test and trial functions. Here we've got uh, a right-hand side, which involves some exponentials, some, some powers, a few bits and pieces. I'm not going to explain it in, in too much detail because there are a few warts in there which, which motivated uh, Phoenix X, among many other things. And so then we've got the bilinear form, the linear form, and we can solve. So, so this is more or less UFL embedded in this Phoenix solver environment where we don't only have the abstract representation of the forms, but we have a, a concrete implementation where we attach data and we actually solve something. So just uh, coming back then to, to UFL. So it's a domain specific language and it's embedded in Python and it targets uh, finite element variational forms. So I, I'd argue it's, it's very expressive. We try, we certainly attempt to have UFL mirror as far as possible standard mathematical notation. It can implement various form manipulations. Uh, you've seen some manipulations already that I just showed in terms of taking derivatives, but it can take adjoints for you. It can uh, compute actions, things like that. And what it does, and I'll show you some moment, one of the things it does is it can represent this abstract representation of the variational problems that can go into a code generator that can com compute the concrete code. So UFL on its own doesn't compute anything that you can actually solve a problem with, and it re will require a back end to do that. So just uh, a little bit of a high level overview of some of the Phoenix technologies and particular things that I'd argue sort of distinguished it from, from many other open source libraries. So some of the core elements in this legacy Phoenix, we had a tabulator for finite element methods that was called Fiat, that was developed by Rob Kirby. We've got the unified form language, which I've just shown, uh, and we've got the compiler FFC, which would turn the UFL input into something concrete. So it typically would create maybe C code, which you can see there on the right. So I think these are these are really the technologies that distinguished Phoenix and then all brought together with just in time compilation and working from Python to allow people to seamlessly define a problem and turn it into to runnable code. So I'm going to show you the, the directed graph that comes out of UFL. So here we just have a, a weighted Poisson equation. So very similar to what I've already shown, but we've just dropped in uh, some coefficient functions. And for this simple case, it will just produce this directed graph and you can ask UFL to, or to print these things out for you. If we go, for example, for a discontinuous Galer conversion of that form, it gets a whole lot more complicated. So for non-trivial equations, this, this graph is not something that you're going to want to read readily, uh, but it does provide this representation of your variational forms, which the uh, form compiler can work on. So what, what I'd argue then is, is you have a language there that allows you to express your, your mathematical intent, but separated in many ways from the implementation details. So ideally with UFL, you really are at a high level expressing your mathematical intent. 
It doesn't encode algorithmic details. You could argue more and more, perhaps it does need to, and that's something that we're thinking carefully about. Uh, it doesn't encode implementation details in terms of how you actually assemble your operator, how you execute the kernels, uh, what linear solver you use, for example. So the early uh, Phoenix form compiler is what did that lifting. It took that UFL input and turned it into C, or at the time it actually generated C++ code. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more later about the next generation of FFC. So here is the generated code it would perhaps uh, create for a particular problem. It's not intended to be machine read, to be human readable. It is actually quite nicely formatted. It's just very difficult to, to convey that on a slide. But we have a particular uh, interface and it generates the implementation. So this is uh, from around 2009 and it's work I did with a PhD student at the time where we looked at different optimizations that we could apply in this code generation step. And we looked at the, at the runtime performance for a variety of different variational forms. What I would say is most of the optimizations that we applied at that time with modern compilers are probably positively harmful. So what we see now, and I'll talk about this later, is we, we want to approach the code generation quite differently with modern compilers uh, compared to what we did back in 2009. So Dolphin is, it was the Phoenix solver library that, that many people are familiar with, and it's really where it brings all the components together. So it brings together the domain specific language UFL that you use to express your, your forms. It integrates the code generator with the backends that will, for example, assemble operators, be that a matrix, a vector, or, or maybe just a scalar. And it manages things like the domain, concrete representations of the mesh. Uh, one thing that is, a common misconception is that the Phoenix libraries and Dolphin in particular are Python libraries, but Dolphin is in fact a C++ and Python library. And, and certainly in an HPC context, most of the work we would do with it would be with, uh, would be with C++. But again, it is a common misconception that it's Python only. So what, what we've really strived to do in our design at the time was to reflect mathematical abstractions, you know, really have a rich way of expressing, representing finite elements, representing function spaces. Uh, and Dolphin would also manage a lot of the parallel aspects of the simulation. But one of the issues common to many libraries is, is that was retrofitted because it was initially serial only. And when it was made parallel, many of us didn't have a very deep understanding of how to do that well at the time. So that's a sort of whistle -top stop tour of, of what I would call legacy Phoenix. And when we started a, really a, a next generation back in about 2008, there were a lot of questions particularly from users as, as to why. Uh, and the reason users question this is because as long as they stayed within the supported abstractions, they could write incredibly compact solvers, often for very, very complicated equations. And, and from their point of view, it generally worked well. But there were a lot of uh, limitations in terms of the user interface, but perhaps even more so behind the scenes in terms of uh, sustainability, maintainability, and our ability to tackle new problems. So it was very hard to break out of supported abstraction. So if it did what you wanted to do, great. If it didn't, uh, it was a problem. It was also difficult to extend and, and build upon, and that's related again to breaking out the abstractions. And in particular, from the Python side, it was very difficult to bring in low level operations, manipulations from Python. And when you could do it from Python, it was very difficult to do that efficiently. So some of the issues that, that, that we started to face as researchers, because fundamentally it was a tool for us to, to test new methods, to solve new problems is we, we found it really difficult to experiment with new methods, particularly anything that required low level operations. It became really, really burdensome. We also had, and this was, a, I think, a, a major risk with open source libraries is we, we did really want to welcome contributions, but what often happens through contributions, but also through the, the research interests of core developers, you end up with a real mishmash of mature technologies, but also immature and niche technologies, but you have them in the core library. So you don't know what's really there for the long term, what, what can you really expect to work and what might be a bit fragile and not, not fully evolved. 
Uh, we had inconsistent behavior in parallel, and again, that was just legacy in terms of its origins. And, and a number of these issues just really slowed down development progress. Rather than being fun and exciting, it became a real chore to, to work behind the scenes. So a particular interest for me now, particularly through some of the exascale computing programs, is, is of course performance. And what, what had happened also over time is, is performance had slipped. And one of the reasons for that is that with complexity, it, it had become quite hard to really see through the code and understand performance and to really see end to end where the performance critical operations are and not have anything slip in that could be harmful. Uh, we went overboard with code generation. It just became a little bit too easy at some point, rather than thinking about a well-designed library, you can just generate some code for that. And that brings a lot of complexity. It slows down development. Even then at runtime, it can start slowing things down because you've got a lot of pre-compilation, you're compiling more stuff than you really need. Some of the generated code became very large. And also it became hard to extend because you might make a modification in one place and you've got this huge opaque tool chain that generates and compiles code that you'd have to update. But a few other issues that, that motivated change in it had become easy for users to write slow code, sometimes thinking we were kind, we had provided interfaces, which ultimately people using a library would not be grateful for, because while it allowed them to perhaps write very compact code, it was not necessarily fast. Uh, too much was going on behind the scenes. So related to that, making it easy to write slow code, we had more than one way to do the same thing without good reason. And again, this was just sort of organic development. We had uh, a library that was too implicit, too much caching of objects, and that made it hard to reason with it sometimes in parallel. It made it hard sometimes to manage uh, memory. And we sometimes would hide expensive steps uh, in this sort of ambition of, sort of ultimate simplicity. Uh, also, and I'll show some results at the end here, just some lots of little technical issues. One, for example, being supporting only a single type. So double, if you're lucky, maybe float, but that, that was it. So that, that motivated us to, to start again with, these, uh, with, with Phoenix X. And, and so we didn't want to start from scratch, but we did want to keep the things that we were happy with. And these, what I would say, really were demonstrated strengths and appropriate abstractions. From a research point of view, one of the, the prerequisites was that we should be able to do everything by hand. So take advantage of domain specific languages, code generation, but when you're exploring something for the first time, you want to be able to do that by hand. You don't want a, a very large upfront investment in a domain specific language, a code generation step, when you're not even sure how to do it and you're not even sure it's going to be worthwhile. Uh, we also wanted to be able to have very efficient implementations that you could uh, employ from, from Python, because that had been very difficult up until uh, we started this redevelopment. I think an absolute given now is we wanted, you know, really solid and consistent parallel behavior. And our understanding of hardware had improved a lot over the years. So we wanted to have what we call really a hardware friendly design. So this is just a bit of background. If you, if you actually go back and you look at where scientific computing was in terms of libraries in the 2000s, Stuff was changing really fast. So the libraries were changing, a lot of the tools were, were developing. So if I think back to when we first started with some of our Python libraries, it's hard to believe that NumPy didn't exist. There was numeric and numarray, and it wasn't really clear at the time which one was going to dominate and different libraries made different choices. Whereas now NumPy is really a given in, in the Python ecosystem. Dolphin, it was originally a C++ library, Python interface came later, and we did that with, with SWIG. So some of you might be familiar with SWIG, but what I'd like to point out is that SWIG uh, promised automated wrapping, but we had 18,000 lines of code to guide the, auto, the automation. And, and more recently, we have tools like PyBind, PyBind 11, which require you to wrap manually. But I'll give you an example there, that we have around 1,500 lines of of C++ to do all that wrapping. And it's just remarkably simpler. We, we had an issue with Sweep. We had one or two developers who understood it, they moved on and we were extremely vulnerable. So it was a very burdensome tool, but things have improved dramatically. The, the other thing, I'm, I'll loop back to this a little bit with how we're designing things now. There was this trend in the 2000s, particularly when it came to C++, I feel, to, to just go completely overboard and a lot of sort of 
gratuitous designs, complexity for the sake of complexity. It made understanding performance very difficult and it made using a library really difficult for many people. So here are some of, some of the tools that have come along that, and we've integrated and I'll explain how we've been able to integrate them. If I'm uh, looking from Python, there's Number, which provides you some just-in-time compilation support. I've already mentioned PyBind 11, uh, really substantial and uh, improvements in C++, particularly from C++ 11, but certainly 14 and onwards. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it today, but we're, we're very, we're really very keen on, on Sickle and, and certainly have the hope that SQL as, uh, as an open specification can compete with uh, implementations and the libraries from NVIDIA and from AMD. And the other thing I'll come to at the end is really auto vectorization is something that's come along hugely in recent years. So just I'm gonna run through the, the, the different Phoenix libraries that we're using in Phoenix X and what we're doing. So UFL is the, the form language, and that's largely unchanged. We're, we're working on it at the moment with some revisions, but we're hoping that will be somewhat incremental. But we were generally happy with the form language and some work to do under the hood, but in terms of its interface, generally satisfied. So this is how, how Phoenix X works. So not so dissimilar to, to the old Phoenix, but at the top there, we have a domain specific language where we can express our problems. We have a library that provides a lot of information on finite elements, uh, finite element tabulation, dual spaces, things like that. Uh, we go through FFCX, which is our new generation of uh, compiler, which can generate kernels. And then that goes into Dolphin X, which is where you orchestrate your solve process. But I've mentioned this already, that one of our fundamental objectives was to be extensible. And so while most people will use that tool chain started from UFL through the code generated Dolphin X. There's nothing to stop you with the new design to plug in kernels to program as you would any other C or C++ libraries. But really, really, we've really thought hard about how users can do whatever they want, but also how can we make that uh, easy for them? So how can they do lots of custom work, perhaps leveraging the automated tools because it frequently that works for 90% of what someone's trying to solve but allow them to fill in that 10% themselves. So this is sort of a, a philosophical part of our design to, to Dolphin X, and it, it differs considerably to our legacy version. So firstly, it has a very functional and data-centric design and is very light on object-oriented design. So there's a lot of working on data and a lot of passing functions operate on data. Uh, we've really strived for pure functions and what that uh, we then have a stateless design and so mathematically it looks a lot better it looks closer to the maps and it's easier to reason with in parallel I mentioned this already much less object oriented design much less data encapsulation uh, we've strived everywhere for much more explicit behavior less magic behind the scenes and again we want everything to be possible by hand exploit the high-level tools when they work, but also to be able to do everything manually. So this is, uh, I'm not quite sure when this count was done, and I, I, I wish I could have added MFEM actually. But this is a, you know, some well, a couple of well-known libraries. And just to, to emphasize, you know, when we get these abstractions right, I think, and some of these design aspects, if you look at Dolphin X, we have 28,000 lines of, of C++ code. I have a collaborator who's very keen on mini apps and I've often asked him how, how many lines do you have to go under before you qualify as a, as a mini app? So you see it's a very compact library. I think that really lends itself to uh, maintenance uh, and for people to understand exactly what's going on. And we have though, been really quite ruthless in, in getting down to that line count. So here's some examples of what I mean about working on data. So the first, a uh, bit of code you see there is from Old Phoenix. And so this was from Python, and we wanted to be able to have these, what we call user expression, just basically a function of X and Y that you might plug into the right-hand side of a, of a variational problem. And so the way we, we dealt with that is we have these, these C strings, and we had our own tool chain that would turn those C strings uh, into code, would compile it just in time, and it was a little bit messy because we don't know what fine element space it's in. It would just sort of default to a Lagrange element here. We've said degree two. And while it doesn't look too bad from a user point of view, uh, 
what went on behind the scenes was, was pretty horrendous and very hard to maintain. What, what you see below is, is our new approach, which exploits NumPy. And rather than working with objects and, and callbacks and things like that, what we simply do here is we just pass functions around. So we've got some function f, depends on x, and that is a basically a vectorized evaluation. So the library can decide for it how many x values it wants to pass. If it wishes, it might pass, typically will, it might pass all the x values for a given mesh, but it could do it in subsets, it could do it by cell type or whatever. Uh, so we've got that Python function, and then we've, we create these functions, function spaces, I've done three of them there, v0, v1, which you, oh, actually I've got two, two v1s. And then we just interpolate that function. So we're passing a function, and that function is just going to operate on the data. Now you see at the bottom there, we can also then do it with lambda functions if we want something uh, really neat and compact. So it's a functional approach, functions operating on data. No classes involved. This is an example, I'd say, of, again, not working on data. This is how you would do something similar from, uh, from the C++ interface. Maybe you have a source function, you have to create a subclass, we have to implement this function. Uh, and what a library would do, it would then call back. So you've got the overhead of virtual function calls. You can't really control easily how much data is being processed each time. But fundamentals that a user has to write this class and, and then in the library, you've got to have these abstract base classes at all in many ways a bit, bit messy and a bit unnecessary. So here's how we would do it now with, how we do it in the new Dolphin X, is we just pass functions. So in this case, we pass a Lambda function, given some values X. So in this case, X is actually a, a MD span. Uh, and the user evaluates their function X and just simply returns data. And what you see at the very bottom there is we're also returning uh, the shape just so we can do some basic checks on rank and, and, and shape. And then the bottom there, you go away and interpolate. it. So again, no classes just to define a, a user-defined mathematical function. Uh, here's just another simple example. This is a geometric operation where we've got a mesh and we're just saying here, can you find all entities? So in this case, it will be maybe edges. Uh, this is gonna be edges. And what we then simply provide are NumPy functions that will to say return true if an edge, in this case, we'll probably just typically uh, compute its midpoint. If it's close to zero, x zero, and if the x component is close to two, it will return true. So it's just a very simple way for, for locating entities. But again, functions operating on data. So here's an example of, of how we've, we're going about supporting different linear algebra backends that we would assemble into. So our old approach is similar, I think, to many libraries, but it led to this sort of nightmare, I'd say, of class hierarchies, boilerplate, trying to wrap all the different uh, backends. And then we'd also be trying to shoehorn different backends that all have their different subtleties into common interfaces. And that sometimes led to, to some unfortunate compromises. So I'm going to show you how we do it now, you know, using a functional approach with captures and no classes. And what's, I think, really exciting about this, it makes it very easy for users to extend it with their own backends without modification of the core library. So here, a little bit to take, you know, I'll just summarize it quickly. So this is how we could assemble a matrix using a pet C, into a pet C sparse matrix. So what we simply do is we create this Lambda function called mat add. It captures A, which is a pointer to the pet C matrix. And we simply define that this function needs to have an interface where it takes the rows, it takes the columns, and it takes the values. And within this function, it will then just call the pet C function for inserting. And at the bottom there is the signature of a function that will assemble a particular bilinear form A into a matrix. So we're not passing the matrix, we're just passing a function that knows how to assemble into that backend. So very similarly, if we want to then go to say tpetra, uh, tpetra design is slightly different. So we just capture a reference to the tpetra matrix, which has been initialized somewhere already. And, but again, we just pass the rows, the columns and the values, and we call the appropriate uh, tpetra function. So that shouldn't be an indirection there, but we, we call the tpetra function, and then we can pass that into exactly the same assemble matrix. But a user now can define whatever linear algebra backend they want without the core library needing to know about it. 
So this, uh, again, apologies, has a lot of code up. This is something we use, for example, if we want to do a geometric partitioning of a mesh in a very particular way. So we have a function that creates a mesh given cells and geometry, uh, but perhaps we want to distribute that in parallel in a very particular way. So by default, there'll be some default partitioners that might call Parmetus or something, something like that. But as a user, you might want to provide your own partitioner. In this case, you just pass through uh, a function which does that distribution. So here is a, an example of a, of a mixed formulation, just to give you a sense of how these things uh, come together. And a particular strength, I think, of Phoenix is when you go into mixed formulations with different spaces, be they Lagrange in different degrees, or whether be Lagrange mixed in with HD of H curl. So you see here a, a Taylor Hood type formulation. So we've got a Lagrange element of degree two and also of uh, degree one. And we combine those, uh, or in fact, in this case, I'm going to do block assembly. So we don't, so we create function spaces. We define test and trial functions. And if you look at that line where it starts with A equals, what you can see there are the four blocks in the Stokes matrix operator. And so we've got a zero on the bottom right, which is just represented there by one. And then what we can do is, is very simply with a particular function, create a, a nested PETC matrix where each of those bilinear forms will be assembled into a matrix block. So the real power is when you can start composing all these different abstractions uh, seamlessly for custom problems. So here is a, a real criticism of the past of Phoenix was that if the form compiler didn't do it, it was really hard. So here is an example where you can actually write uh, assembly kernel. You can write kernels in Python. In this case, you use number that then we pass a function pointer into the library and we can use all the existing assembler functionality, but we've provided our own compiled kernel from Python. And this is what some people have used to implement things like static condensation, which are not so very straightforward to express uh, using the high level tools. So you, you have a kernel that has an interface, uh, then you can you do particular minute, you can call various sub kernels. And at the end there, you can call using NumPy type syntax, uh, various operations, which number will typically implement in BLAS or LAPAC. And then you can just simply take the address for that kernel, send it into your assembler and away you go. This is actually an example where a user who might say, all I want is the parallel distributed mesh. I don't care about any of the built-in assemblers. I want to do it myself. Here is a very simple assembler for the right-hand side for a lowest order uh, Lagrange element for, for the Poisson equation. Uh, and we have a very simple function here, which will compute the area of a triangle. And the function below does the assembly. So it iterates over all the cells, uh, computes the area of the of the given cell and inserts terms into the into the vector that we're assembling into. Uh, so the implementation of the distributed parallel mesh, that's all in C++, you can access the raw data structures and send that into these number functions. So there's, there's lots more I could say, but I just want to touch on a few topics. I'm just want to talk a bit about very briefly about performance. I'm not going to show any particular data and, and the Actually, the one bit of data I will show is, is very much preliminary and, and a moving target. But one thing we make extensive use of are MPI neighborhood collectives. It, in my view, makes implementing unstructured grid codes so much easier than it ever was before. It's really a, a fantastic match, neighborhood collectives in MPI3 and unstructured grids. But one of the issues is when you work with unstructured grids and you work with neighborhoods, is you do need to build the neighborhoods so, so recently we were, we were working on Archer 2, which is the UK national supercomputer. And we just wanted to, for a particular problem, we wanted to push it out to a trillion cells. And it's a very simple problem and there's lots of stuff we haven't optimized. But what we saw, and it's quite remarkable actually, that MPI all to all is very clever in its ability to scale until you get to a relatively high uh, node count. And then it just, it just tanks. And that's what we were seeing here in the creation of our mesh. The MPI all to all was became a massive bottleneck uh, in trying to find these neighborhood, uh, these local neighborhoods. Because once we found the neighborhoods, the communication pattern is very, very local. 
So something we, we changed in response to that was a really neat algorithm that's in a paper that's listed there at the bottom from 2010. And it's, it's fundamentally just a really clever way to find neighborhoods. And that's it's so typical in unstructured grid methods that you're trying to find the, the, the neighborhoods that maybe share a facet. If you're looking at ghost regions in a vector, you know, you've got these, these local neighborhoods that you want to identify. And, and so it's a fantastically simple algorithm. It does use a, a probably somewhat rarely used MPI function, which I certainly wasn't aware of, which is a non-blocking barrier. But that's one of the, the key ingredients to make this work. And what we saw when we used it, so it should get, in fact, it should get our neighborhood detection down to log P complexity. And we were able to, to really accept, you know, dramatically accelerate that detection of the neighborhood. So there, there were quite a few changes that went on in this code. So you don't pay too much attention to the jump that you see on the right hand side because it was a little bit of a moving target. But we were able to, to eliminate this horribly non scalable neighborhood uh, detection and eliminate all the all all to all uh, calls in the code. So I'm just going to touch now. I've talked a little bit about. Uh, Dolphin X and the uh, solver environment. I'll talk a little bit about the form compiler. This is going to slide into to part two when I look at some of the kernel uh, optimizations. So, so we started from the old form compiler, but really uh, generate, uh, sorry, simplified it significantly. We now generate C code, but we're working on generating uh, GPU backends. It really does work now on generating what we call the minimal canonical data, the things that we that really are problem specific. Anything that can go into a library goes into a library. I'll share some results in a moment where we've done a lot of work on making it uh, vectorization friendly, particularly for auto vectorizers. Uh, I'll show also results where we're exploring now different types, half precision, single precision, doubles. Uh, and we're also supporting, we support different cell types and, and techniques like some factorization, whereas uh, the old four compiler was very much for simplicities only. So just a, a, a quick taste of uh, where we slipped in terms of performance. So I said with the old Phoenix, we, we had lost sight to performance. And here is a, a problem. So we're on tetrahedra, we've got degree four Nedelec elements. Uh, this is sort of the mass matrix. And really by just going back, looking carefully at performance, looking at how vectorization was working, looking at carefully using tools like Godbolt, what was happening, uh, there was just dramatic performance improvements that, that we could make. And at the same time, a lot of simplification. So you see, you know, we much, much, much faster with, with our new version for this particular problem. So the kernel code, again, it, it does what FFC does. It takes UFL input on the left-hand side and turns it into kernel code. But again, it, it computes now really just the element kernels, whereas before it was generating a lot of information on finite element bases, it was generating too much information on how DOV maps should be constructed. It's really been boiled down to the basics. So that actually takes me into a new library, which is also called Basics. Uh, and this is something we developed in recent years to help us generalize some of our finite element formulations. So we've got UFL describes our input, FFC turns that into executable kernels, but somewhere we need to plug in the finite element uh, information. So Basics is a relatively new library, C++, C, experimental and Python interfaces, but it can basically tabulate basis functions. It, it knows a lot of quadrature schemes, uh, critically, and something we didn't have before, it produces interpolation operators. So if you just if you want to interpolate a user-defined function, it tells you the points at which it needs to be evaluated, and then can turn those into DOVs. Uh, but it can also interpolate between different finite element spaces. It can take care of any mappings that are required, and uh, it, it generates arbitrary order finite elements. So I've just listed there a few of the elements that it can generate on different shapes. Uh, but it's also got an interface that allows you to define custom elements so you can provide uh, operators that define how the degree the freedom should be computed so basic defines the dual space and then basics can run the machinery over that to produce to create a finite element it also does and this is one of our early motivations it provides a lot of transformation information because what we struggled with were particularly with hexahedral meshes that were not ordered is how to actually handle high order elements and particularly looking at HDF or H curl probably being the most difficult. So it provides a lot of information on how we can uh, perform operation or transformations. So it allows us to work with basically polyhedral meshes. Uh, so we can go even go beyond hexahedra 
and we can still construct appropriate degree of freedom maps. So just a, a summary of some of the Phoenix X developments before I talk about some performance issues is we've really driven towards a data oriented functional design and really to focus on what, what can something do, not what it is. And it's helped us a lot, I think, in terms of seeing through the performance. We can see through because we're really focusing much more on the data, what's happening. It's become much easier for us to reason with in parallel. Uh, it allows users to inject functions and kernels without all the boilerplate of, uh, of classes. And when you're working with data and functions, it's a lot easier to work across languages. And what we're also seeing, and this is ongoing work, that it, it, it lends itself much better towards GPU implementations because we can unwrap that raw data and, and work with it. So I think that the code base is remarkably small. I mentioned it's like 28,000 lines of C++. Again, I want to emphasize we have C++ and Python interfaces, and certainly for HPC, we would work with C++. I think there are real questions about whether Python and similar languages will ever be suitable for, for high-performance computing. I would tend towards saying they're not ever going to be suitable. Uh, something that surprises people a bit when they come to a library like Phoenix is it has no predefined operators or kernels. So you generate those or write them yourselves. And for performance, we've really tried to go for minimal JIT, so focusing on where it's really most needed. And, and in terms of this data-oriented functional design, when you boil it down to it, if you develop a finite element library, I'd say it really isn't much more than adjacency lists, algorithms that build those lists and operate on them, and then finite element kernels that you execute. So that, that is boiling it down a little too much. There's a lot of important support functionality that goes around it. But when it comes to the core operations, that, that really is all there is. So just in this second part, I want to move on to some recent work we've been doing on high performance uh, kernels. And as I said at the beginning, this was motivated very much by some of the work going on in the seed program and the Bake Off problems, which I think have been hugely helpful in allowing different groups of different libraries to just measure where they're at and, and seeing where there's perhaps scope to, to gain in terms of performance by looking at the work of others. So I'm going to, to present some measured data against a performance model. So what you see in the top left there is this sort of standard roofline model, which uh, basically says that you're limited either by flops or bandwidth. So rather than going through it all in detail, you've got this fraction FD over BD, that's basically arithmetic intensity times the uh, bandwidth, and that will be the DRAM bandwidth. We found that was not really predicting very well what we were observing in, in practice. So we worked and we're still working on what I'd say is a, is a cache aware roofline model, which basically says that our performance is limited by peak flops, our DRAM bandwidth, or our cache speed. And so when we're looking at the cache speed, we have then there's no single cache. So we then also have to think about how much data for a given problem. So how big are the tables, how big are the temporaries that we require, because that will tell us which level of cache we're going to fit into. So what I'll present though is throughput. So DOVs per second as is typical in, in a lot of the seed benchmarks. So that uh, DOVs per second is going to depend on this, this, this roof line limit and uh, the number of flops that we need to perform per, per degree of freedom. So to start with, I'm just I'm actually gonna show memory bandwidth. This is something we're still working on. It's remarkably difficult to measure uh, cache speeds. So there's data here for the uh, ARM architecture, the A64FX, that of course is in Fugaku. So that has L1, L2, but no L3 cache, but very fast DRAM. And they've also got the AMD Milan and the AMD Isolate. Uh, they're very similar with the exception that the AMD Milan has a significant larger L3 cache. So we've used a library to measure the bandwidth. We're trying some other libraries to try and get some, some better measurements to feed into our performance model. But the results I'll show are going to work with this data. So firstly, before doing any computations, these are sort of the roof line plots for the A64FX. So I'm showing it here in half precision, single precision, and double precision. The blue line is basically the DRAM memory bandwidth limit. Uh, the green is where we're flop limited, and the orange is where we're limited by the cache. So this is for a tetrahedral cell standard sort of assembly. Uh, so what you see here is somewhat, perhaps not so surprising, is the A6 FX has a lot of memory bandwidth. So uh, that is the least of our worries. 
But what you see here is that performance is in fact going to be limited by our cache speed. And what you see with that roof line, which is tracking the cache limit, is as we go up in polynomial degree, our tables get very big and we occasionally will then spill from one cache level to the next, and we see a corresponding drop in performance. Uh, and so what you'll typically see is rather than there being a factor two difference between say half precision and double precision, uh, the difference can grow because half precision is able to, in many cases, stay in a faster cache. So here's a similar thing for the, for the isolate chip. So the isolate you see at low order, low order finite elements, again, this is just the mass action, is unsurprisingly limited by the DRAM. But as we get out a bit further, we're not limited actually by flops, but we're limited by cache speed. And similarly, as you go out to different orders, so if you look at double precision, uh, you certainly see it at, at P6, you see a particular drop, P7. So it's spilling into slower levels of cache. Uh, so this is then the Milan, very similar to the Intel chip, a bit better in bandwidth. So the transition points come a little bit later in terms of uh, polynomial degree, but we see a similar effect and you see at certain polynomial degrees, the performance drops off. So what, we're going to sh what I'm showing here is actually our measured performance uh, versus the model. So this is on the Intel Isolate, single precision and double precision, and it tracks it very well. One of the reasons we actually did this work is we wanted to somehow quantify how good our auto how good auto vectorizers are. And there was a real jump between about GCC eight or nine to the next generation of compilers that we observed with a quite a step change in their ability to auto vectorize very well. So we constructed our kernels very carefully. And what you see there, batch size one is where we're just executing a kernel on a sing single element at a time. Uh, where you see a batch size greater than one we're executing the kernel over multiple cells at a time to exploit, in this case, the AVX 512. So that's why in double precision, we're executing eight cells at a time. In single precision, we're doing uh, 16. And interestingly, in quite a few cases, the case where we don't use the, the, the vector extensions is actually faster. And what we've seen is compilers can start doing really clever things. So it's good to not pad loops because some compilers now can actually mix SIMD instructions. So they can do some AVX 512 and end the loop and I do AVX 2. So we were really pleased with this because that blue line is just vanilla code. There's no uh, intrinsics, no vector extensions. And you can see it also tracks very nicely our performance model. A64FX is, is a bit more difficult. Uh, it's a little bit more erratic. One thing that we've seen is we don't believe the compilers are very good for the A64FX. When we look at the instructions that are being issued, they're not as good as what we see on the x86 architectures. Also, the cache is quite complicated on the A64FX. It's not sort of symmetric in terms of its speed. Uh, and so we, we're having trouble really making a lot of sense of A64FX. But in many ways, it feels a little bit like legacy hardware now and that there are a newer generations of ARM chips coming out. So this is moving on to something which is much more like the seed benchmark. So we're looking here at hexahedra, some factorization. Uh, and we've got the roofline models here for the A64FX. You can see that in this case, uh, the DRAM memory bandwidth is never a bottleneck. So it's got a lot of bandwidth compared to flops. The flops not a limit, but we see here the cache speed is actually what's limiting uh, our performance. And you'll see now as we go to higher degree, we're going to higher degree now than I did on the previous plots that particularly say for a double precision, you get to a certain point, say P11, and you're sort of dropping into another cache level. In fact, I think, and eventually you're dropping down into the uh, DRAM, whereas with half precision, single precision, you stay in the cache. What I should have mentioned, we are scattering the results uh, back to DRAM, but in a sort of DG style. So we're not, we're doing a very regular scatter. So if we see with the ice lake, uh, things are much closer in the very early stages. We're limited by DRAM, but as we increase the polynomial degree, we seem to be limited by, by cache speed. Uh, and again, if you look at double precision, we get out to P12. After that, we see the performance dropping off. That's because we're spilling into another level of cache. So looking at the, the ice lake performance, we find that our, our measured results track reasonably well that black line, which is our model. 
uh, better for double precision than for, for single precision. And again, with double precision, we see if we do this cross element vectorization or single cell, there's really uh, not much difference. Single precision and for lower precision, that's when processing multiple cells at once does seem to give quite a good benefit because it's a lot harder to find the, the parallelism because if you're doing single precision, AVX 512, you do need a lot of parallelism. And if you go to things like Sapphire Rapids and you're doing half precision, you need a lot of parallelism to exploit the SIMD instructions. Uh, A64FX, again, it's a bit hard to make much sense of it. We know that it doesn't auto vectorize as well as what we see on, on x86. Uh, but I think what we'd like to do is look at some of the newer generation of ARM chips. So just moving on to some different operators here on a hexahedron, we're looking at more complicated problems now, looking at weighted uh, Laplacian. Again, we see with single precision, lower orders, it's worth processing multiple elements at once. Once we get to higher orders, it's not necessarily worthwhile. And it does tend to then put more pressure on the cache because we're generating more temporaries, more other variables. Uh, looking at double precision, again, not, not so very different, but we see that the batch size, so we're pressing more elements once, that really does start to drop off as we apply more pressure uh, on the memory. So just in summary, and this is sort of very preliminary work, is that we're seeing that we believe that a lot of these kernels are limited by, by cache speed. Uh, just to be a little bit assertive, I'd say that uh, this cross element or batch type vectorization uh, doesn't offer much in the way of vectorization benefits in double precision over carefully designed single cell kernels. And again, those single kernel, single cell kernels have no non-stand, no, um, no extensions. What we see though is this cross element vectorization can really come into its own at reduced order. It just helps you find a lot more parallelism that you really need at those reduced orders. Uh, we see all sorts of different effects. So for hexahedral cells, we see that this cross element or batch assembly uh, can cause early cache spilling. But on the contrary, on simplices where even the single cell, because we'd have very large tables, will start to spill, that it, there can be benefits in having cross element, because I think we're loading parts of the table into memory, using that for multiple cells and then loading the next part of the table. Uh, and particularly when we go to HDiv and HCurl. So no doubt there are some cleverer things we can do there, but for standard HDiv, HCurl at high order, the tables are very big. Uh, so the kernels that I've been shown, or the kernels that I've showed experiments for, they're generated by FFCX, so very easy for, for people to uh, access. Uh, and we're working with GPUs currently, and we're also looking at some uh, fast techniques that we can apply to, to simplex cells. So that's, that's all I, I wanted to say today. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. So I, I wanted to say thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, a lot of the challenges and the, the kind of research topics that you mentioned, I think resonate with, with a lot of us. Um, and I also see a lot of opportunities for collaboration here. So this was really great, very inspiring. Thank you. Um, questions. I see some questions from Walt in the chat. Walt, do you want to just unmute and ask them? Sure. Yeah. So I, I was wondering, uh, were you using like Swig type maps and all and, and stuff like that before? Oh, sorry. Now Garth is muted. G Garth, you're muted now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about yeah. that. So what we, we had a couple of experts who could do a lot of stuff, but we only had, in fact, we had one who left and it was a whole other language. Uh, it was quite expensive to build and we, we just couldn't, we had a huge amount of code. We had all sorts of type maps to, to work with NumPy and things, but no one understood it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, has your experience with PyBind 11 then been, been good? Oh yeah, it's 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 very very simple. Uh, it's and it's really designed for numerical computation from the off. So it's got a lot of support. You want to you know map arrays between two languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, we've had some folks with similar experiences with Swig. They were stuck on a super old version of Swig because they were relying on some highly specialized you know template type map handling things. And so that that's good to hear though that Pi Nine Eleven is working for you because yeah, I see you are using. A decent amount of you know modernish C plus plus. So, all right, thank you, uh, Sam. Do you want to ask a question? 
Sorry, I just wanted to interject. Um, the author of PyBind 11 has a, a newer version, NanoBind, so uh, Benzel Jakob, and it's it's in, improved some support for interop with NumPy and stuff like that, and lower overhead and uh, compiles faster and stuff. So if you guys aren't playing with that, oh. I recommend it. Yeah, so we, we, we have experimented with, with NanoBind, and we're hoping as a first step to move uh, basics over to it. But it has some issues that uh, an issue that's open, which is handling uh, read-only arrays, that we really okay. have to have fixed before we can move on. But yeah, I think it's probably the only only open issue on the uh, nano bind issue tracker. That, that's that's good to know. Thanks. Okay, other questions for Gart. Um, I had a technical question. So you said that the. Uh, and I, I apologize, I'm not too familiar with Phoenix, but um, you mentioned that the this FFC targets um, C code generation. Is there any reason for doing that as opposed to going through LLVM or something? Some of the, I know some JIT uh, people like going through LLVM because then you get the backends basically for free. Um, yeah, so we looked at that, and, and, and one of the reasons why it would be really appealing, particularly in HPC environments, is to be able to do everything in memory. But to be honest, it's just beyond our expertise. You know, the LLVM intermediate representation is really low level uh, and it's not something we'd have the skills to do. Need to hire more people. Um, all right. Um, Sam, do you have any other questions? All right, anybody else? Let me ask something real quick. Um, so one thing that you didn't um, talk a lot about, Garth, is GPUs. What are the particular challenges and, and capabilities, the interest in, in optimizing for GPUs? Yes, yeah, so I guess as many people know, it, it's just that kind of design space for the kernels is so vast and uh, so varied in that we, we we would like. I mentioned we would really like if we can if we can work through through SQL being an open specification. We've done quite a lot of work in that area. We, we're going to be picking it up again now that we've, we we wrapped up some of the CPU stuff. But it's just it. You just go as as you know, son. You go from architecture to architecture. And what works great on one suddenly doesn't. Yep. It's terrible on the other. And I think it, for me, one of the real questions is sustainability with all these different backends, all the different hardware is how do we actually create code that we, we're confident is performant, but we can also maintain with a reasonable number of people. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, I don't have any solutions. Uh, I just, I just wanted to hear your thoughts. That's all. Yeah. It is, it is. 1 of the more challenging aspects of HPC these days. And I think when you get to GPU things we're looking at is, is not only the kernels, but then how do you deal with MPI? So because all the, there's different hardware in terms of how you communicate between them, and it's just, it's just very varied. Right there. Okay, other questions for Garth? So we'll post it in the chat. Super interesting talk. Um, there are a lot of parallels with the issues that we're tracking and developing also in MFAM. I, I think that's very fair. Okay, Natalie. Did you raise your hand? Uh yeah, I was just wondering. I I worked a, I've worked a little bit with Phoenix a long time ago now. And I remember you know it had this nice, very kind of high level interface with the UFL and the way you describe things. Um, but then also in your uh, interesting results you were showing, comparing the results you were getting to the roof line and the different architectures, um, looking at you know the difference of whether you had the batch, the cross element vectorization or, or not, and how many elements, um, would all of that, I assume, be decided by Phoenix kind of under the hood? Like most users would never be able to play with that tuning themselves, you'll you'll hopefully have picked for them, or is there also a way that they could go in and do that? Or I, I'm not I'm not too sure at the moment what we will do because it's it's very experimental and we're really uh, manipulating things at a very low level. I think we'd have to have a bit of a better understanding of where you know of how it all works before we can decide whether it should be done automatically or whether a user 
uh, could decide. What, what is nice is that when you generate the code, it can automatically compute, you know, number of memory movements, number of operations. So it can provide some information for different algorithms that could guide those decisions. Whether they would ever be automated or not, I'm not sure. We, we, we're really happy though that without, in most cases, that without using this batched or cross element vectorization, that performance is more or less the same, at least for double precision. It wasn't when we first mm -hmm. started. We had to really engineer our kernels quite carefully because that presents far fewer choices. So if we can get away with something simple and performant across a range of problems, that would be ideal. We, we probably assumed at the beginning that we would have to do this cross element vectorization to get good performance. And I think with earlier versions of compilers, you probably did have to. So we thought that's done for double precision. We don't need to do cross element, but then when you go to reduce precision, it becomes a whole other story again. Mm. Thanks. Okay, so Sam, do you wanna unmute and say this or is this more of a comment in the chat? Uh, just maybe an explanation of some of the performance numbers. I would imagine that vectorization would be most beneficial if you're compute bound, but you're showing that you're limited mostly by um, your cache or something. So vectorization may not have as much of a, a benefit there. Yeah, but but if you don't reach that, uh, if you don't reach, if you don't vectorize well, you'll be even lower because those performance models are kind of assuming that you're able to hit the peak flops. Oh, okay. So the reason we looked at that is we were trying to figure out when we restructure our kernels, is auto vectorization as good as it gets, or have we left something on the table? And we had a bit of trouble making, you know, really trying to figure that out. So we, we could turn auto vectorization on and off, but that doesn't tell you the full story. So that's why we actually went to the performance model to try and understand, uh, have we got our full, uh, are we at full performance or not? But if we were turn, to turn auto vectorization off, you'd see a drop. Because basically, you'd reduce by a factor of, of eight, roughly, the, uh, the the flop limit. For the auto vectorization, was was most of your experience with GCC, Garth? No, GCC and with Clang. And they both around the same time seem to have quite a step change. And I, I mentioned in the middle of my presentation, we had all these optimizations we did in the very early version of FFC. And, and I did say that they would now be positively harmful because they were mm -hmm. trying to monkey around with the code. Whereas what mm -hmm. we see now is, is just really about having very good memory access patterns. There's no need to pad loops, for example, compilers can do that. And what we see with, as I mentioned it with Godbolt is they'll even do things like mixing SIMD instructions. And again, this is getting a bit far from my expertise, but apparently the latency of say AVX2 operations is lower than AVX512 and that's where we see sometimes one of the explanations why our auto vectorized code can actually be uh, faster than when we're trying to use intrinsics and things. All right, thank you. Okay, other questions? Right, I have one. Um, for the higher order results that you showed with simplices, do you use any form of um, do you use store things at quadrature points only, for example, what we call partial assembly, or do you use some any form of, you know, some factorization like for the burn time basis or something like that, or is this plain assembly of element matrices so, even so at the case, higher level? The cases I showed here were just plain, plain, assemb plain assembly. Uh, mm -hmm. What's interesting is you can get quite a bit of mileage out of that with simplices because you can have some very good quadrature schemes. Uh, mm -hmm. So you reduce a lot of the geometry data. Something we're looking at now, we've been playing around with just for a few weeks, is looking at Bernstein polynomials. Mm -hmm. but I think that's going to be a case where that, that batch or cross element vectorization is the way you have to do it. Because when you do the Bernstein polynomials, the access patterns are very irregular mm -hmm. for a single cell. And so that's what we're we, we, we're working on at the moment, and we're quite positive that uh, Bernstein bases, but with this batched type assembly, will be a, a good way to go. And just curious, what's the motivation for looking at the Bernstein, the Bernstein bases? Uh, so for basically for for fast uh, fast simplices, fast okay. high order simplices. Because what what we have, I mean, we haven't. There are some papers out there that look at some of the. Uh, some of these Duffy transforms. And when we 
we, there's some published papers, we have access to the same hardware and maybe the implementations are different, but our vanilla simplex code is generally faster than their some factorization Duffy transform style code. And it could be down to the number of quadrature points. So, but so I think those more traditional ways of dealing with simplices at practical orders, I'm not sure they're really worth it. I, I, I agree with that. All right. Final questions for Garth? All right, well, we'll uh, post the talk again and the slides, uh, if you don't mind sharing them, Garth, and then I'm sure people will have more questions and follow up. Uh, thanks again. Um, let's uh, give him one more round of applause here. Virtual, sorry. Um, and thank you everyone uh, for attending. Um, we'll, we'll continue with the series in a month from now. Um, have a have a good evening there uh and we'll we'll catch up thanks for the invitation yeah thank you bye bye everyone <laughs>